top of the morning to you and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion. I'm Olumide Makoli. The headlines. IAEA chief Rafael Grossi visits Zaporizhia nuclear plant urges for protection of site in more dangerous phase. Denmark salvages mystery object near Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Plus, King Charles III visits Germany in first state visit to discuss climate change and Ukraine crisis, amongst other concerns. Thank you so much for joining us. The head of the UN nuclear watchdog, Rafael Grossi, said Ukraine's embattled Zaporizhia nuclear plant faced a perhaps more dangerous phase after seeing increased military activity and damage to the surrounding area during a visit to the site. Mr. Grossi said working out an agreement on the protection of the plant has to be stepped up. He's been pushing for a demilitarized zone at the Russian-held power station Europe's largest nuclear facility, which has come under repeated shelling. In the course of my seventh uh, visit to Ukraine and after my second visit to the Saporizia nuclear power plant, I am now more convinced than ever that the protection of the plant is absolutely necessary. I've been able to assess the damage sustained by this facility after the shelling of November the 20th and also the problems that occurred after the repeated blackouts. Protect Zaporizhia is possible. The IAEA and I myself will continue to work to this. Meanwhile, Grossi posted the video after his second visit to the nuclear power station in southeastern Ukraine. Moscow and Kiev have repeatedly accused each other of shelling the site of the power station over the last year. The IAEA has had to monitor station at the plant since September when Grossi traveled to the facility as fears were mounting of the possibility of a nuclear accident. Now, the Danish Energy Agency, meanwhile, said an object found close to the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline in the Baltic Sea appeared to be a maritime buoy and does not pose a safety risk. The object, which has retrieved by the Danish Navy, was discovered during an inspection of the last remaining intact pipeline by Swiss-based operator Nord Stream 2 AG. Last week, Denmark invited the Russian-controlled Nord Stream operator to assist in retrieving the project. A representative from Nord Stream 2 AG was present during the operation, which was carried out at a depth of 73 meters. Meanwhile, Finnish aircraft took part in NATO exercises in Estonia alongside French, Dutch and Estonian fighter jets. The Finnish FA-18 jets visited the Amari Air Base, home to NATO's Baltic Air Policing Detachments, for the first time since 2019. Finland's ambassador to Estonia, Visa Vasara, said he was pleased with Hungary ratifying Helsinki's membership into the alliance. Hungary's parliament approved the bill on Monday to allow Finland to join NATO once its application has been ratified by all 30 members of the alliance, ending months of foot dragging by the ruling Fid to party on the matter. And the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning says China maintains communication with all parties involved, including Ukraine, after an apparent invitation to visit from Ukraine to China. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky extended an invitation to the Chinese President Xi Jinping to visit the country in an interview with the Associated Press. Meanwhile, the Chinese President Xi Jinping is expected to meet Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez in Beijing this week. They will ostensibly be celebrating half a century of diplomatic relations by discussing economic and trade ties. However, 
Analysts have said that the real subject for conversation between the two leaders will be the fate of Ukraine, as Spain is about to join international efforts to end the invasion by Russia. Spain has been thrust center stage as a possible diplomatic interlocutor in the conflict because it takes over the European Union's rotating presidency in July, at a time when Europe is experiencing its first major land war since World War II. The Spanish Premier will be keen to let the Chinese Communist leader know when they meet that he believes Ukraine should have a right to decide on any possible peace agreement with Russia. Meanwhile, German President Frank Walter Steinmeier welcomed King Charles and his wife, Queen Consort Camilla, with military honors at Berlin's landmark, the Brandenburg Gate, on the King's first state visit abroad since becoming British monarch. King Charles spoke of the warmth of friendship between the UK and Germany, saying in his first state visit abroad since ascending the throne last year that it was a friendship which mattered greatly to his mother, late Queen Elizabeth II. Over a three-day visit to Berlin, Brandenburg in the east and the northern port city of Hamburg, King Charles will attend engagements reflecting issues facing both countries, such as environmental sustainability and the Ukraine crisis, and will also commemorate the past. <laughs> Over all these years and in so many ways, I have been struck by the warmth of the friendship between our nations and by the vitality of our partnership in countless areas. It was, Mr. President, a friendship which mattered greatly to my mother, the late Queen, who cared deeply about the bond between our two countries. Our countries are working together to promote global health, to help developing countries overcome their challenges and prosper, and to advance the urgent and vital journey towards net zero. And of course, we stand side by side in protecting and advancing our shared democratic values. This is epitomized so clearly today as we stand together with Ukraine in defense of freedom and sovereignty in the face of unprovoked aggression. Over all these years, and in so many ways, I have been struck by the warmth of the friendship between our nations and by the vitality of our partnership in countless areas. It was, Mr. President, a friendship which mattered greatly to my mother, the late Queen, who cared deeply about the bond between our two countries. In Germany, following the sadness of her death last year, our countries are working together to promote global health, to help developing countries overcome their challenges and prosper, and to advance the urgent and vital journey towards net zero. And of course, we stand side by side in protecting and advancing our shared democratic values. This is epitomized so clearly today as we stand together with Ukraine in defense of freedom and sovereignty in the face of unprovoked aggression. Zum Wohl. King of England, King Charles III. Now, the Kremlin says Russia's confrontation with hostile states and what it called a hybrid war being waged against it by the West would last a long time. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov made the prediction when he asked how long what Russia calls its special military operation in Ukraine would last when he was asked that. 
Peskov, in his words, replied, if you are referring to a war in a broader context, a confrontation with hostile states, a hybrid war against our country, then it is going to last for a long time. And here we need to be resolute and self-confident and to consolidate around the president. Now we're going to be speaking with Mr. Yin Kao Yeniji, the international and international affairs analyst, speaking to us from out of East Midlands, East Midlands in the UK. You're welcome to the program this morning. Morning. Let's begin with the King's visit to Germany, knowing that Germany has been a vocal supporter of Ukraine, as a matter of fact, just delivered leopard tanks as per their promise uh, for the infantry warfare of Ukraine in defense of the Russian aggression. Obviously, it'll be, uh, what do you make of this visit as far as encouraging the efforts against uh, Russia? Well, I, I think that um, that visit should be put in perspective. Uh, the coronation for the king is happening in a few days, uh, by the first week of May. And uh, as soon as uh, King Charles uh, became inaugurated as a king, following the demise of his mother, the late queen last year, he had to take, uh, if you like, homage from different parts of the country, first in the United Kingdom. So he was at Aberdeen, he's been at Ireland, and all of that. And parliaments have been paying homage and declaring their um, obedience to the king. He has to, the next phase of that will be to move to Europe, where uh, UK continues to play a pivotal role with respect to security, economy, and all of this. So. I think that this visit is to be seen only from a uh, perspective, which is that the king wants to make as many visits as possible to his counterparts all over Europe before the coronation happens in the first week of May. It just so happens that in this season, uh, we are talking about the Ukrainian war, all right? And that's why uh, that is on the table. But as much as possible, the king will leave matters uh, which concern uh, state security, international politics to the, uh, to the premier, who is uh, Rishi Sunak, the prime minister of England. It is his responsibility uh, to drive that process, and he's been doing a good job of that. So this particular visit is to say thank you, Germany, for standing by uh, England on the demise of the late queen. Uh, thank you, because I expect that you'll be at the coronation and you'll provide support, and then uh, recognize that I'm now the de facto uh, monarch of, of, of England. There's nothing more than that. And it's worthy of note to also see that Germany has received the king in that light. Was, uh, his, his aircraft was escorted with their own uh, warplanes, showing their own military might. And it's a mark of honor to say, welcome, king, the first historic visit on your ascendancy to the throne. But such other matters as relating to state governance and international politics will be left to the premier, uh, Rishi Sunak, the prime minister of England. Yeah, we know that, but it takes a very good picture when you see Germany and when you see the UK standing in solidarity with each other, especially with such an iconic um, figure as the king visiting Germany just during this war with Ukraine, even though people who are of the mind that Germany is not doing much to temper the flame of the war can do better. But let's stay with the king, for instance. We know that it's ceremonial as far as his advising uh, governments is concerned. But it, takes, it, it, looks, it looks pretty good PR, doesn't it? So, well, yeah. So most of the things we do nowadays have the perception of uh, image and public engagement in it. Remember that the king was supposed to be in France, all right? And because there's crisis going on, there have been strikes and it's becoming a bit violent, the king called off that visit. All right, it's hard to reschedule his itinerary every now and again when it can be misconstrued as if he's supporting one side against the other. So as much as possible, the, the, the question of whether Germany is doing enough to support Ukraine is mute. That question has been fully answered because Germany has now provided uh, the authority for countries with uh, the leopard tanks to uh, move them to Ukraine. So, yes, it is good to see the king there in Germany at this time, 
but it was almost an afterthought, okay? It would have been in France uh, discussing with the, uh, uh, President Macron, okay? But that was called off last minute, and then he's had to change his itinerary uh, to be in Germany at this time. It is good. It is good PR. It is good community engagement in international politics. It shows support, just like he has rightly said. But at this time, there's every distinct possibility that Germany even needs the UK more than UK needs Germany at this time with a rocky economic outlook. So it is good. It drives the message, but the context should never be lost, which is that this is a brand new king who is reestablishing links that his moms created many decades ago. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church have been asked by President Zelensky and the Ukrainian government to leave their site. And this has been met with uh, refusal by the monks at that church, which happens to be the, the main church of the state of Ukraine. Now, there were accusations uh, uh, by the Ukraine or allegations from the Ukrainian government that some of the leaders of the church are in sympathy with Russia having come out of the church about almost a year ago. But we know how influential the church is with the Ukrainian people. And I recall now that one of the, uh, one of the citizens of Ukraine says that Zelensky should, should backtrack on that and not ask them to leave their sites, uh, the monastery where they're located, because the monks are like real life saints. In going on with the war, is there a danger that the president will run afoul of the sentiments of the people of Ukraine who hold the church in high esteem? Honestly, there is a distinct possibility that that will happen. But of course, we also have some uh, measures to try to uh, tone down the impact. So uh, you are looking at uh, Boris Johnson, who has also visited Ukraine again and again. And the church respects him a lot in that regard. Now, understand this. When it comes to international politics, there are a few sentiments that have um, held sway over time, and they will continue to, such include religion. Remember also that Ukraine and Russia uh, have, all, have been together for a very long time. They're almost like siblings of the same parents. They've had different leaders, and that has resulted in this war. But they have closer links. They have possibly closer links in heritage, culture, history, much more than the enmity that, that has escalated between them in recent times. All right? The church plays a role. Russia, on its own, even with all the evil that Putin is meting out to, on the rest of the world, they hold Christianity very paramount. And they don't joke with it at all. All the way St. Petersburg, all, all, all over in Russia, they don't play and they don't joke with Christianity. So you will find that on the basis of religion, there will be some citizens who also draw links, ancestry to Russia, who will possibly uh, be holding uh, sentiments that Russia will guarantee their right to practice Christianity and uphold it. Zelensky is a man facing war at this time. That will not be his concern. All right, so it's it's brewing. It could very well escalate, but it won't play a distinct role at this time. At the end of the day, the uh, Christianity has been practiced in Ukraine will still be upheld. Russia will never back down from holding up or upholding what it calls the highest values of Christianity. But then the citizens, especially those in the border towns where Russia claims to have an ex, will have to determine where they want to play their allegiance to the state of Ukraine or to Russia. It, will, it, it could very well escalate, but not in a uh, great magnitude. It will still be toned down. You may find Boris Johnson visiting again and just telling everybody, take it easy, we are in a time of war, which is what it is. It's first my job at this time. We respect your rights as uh, Christians to uphold your faith, but we are in a first my job situation, and some of those rights have to be sus suspended as it is. Is there a pro-Russian sentiment in Ukraine? Because staying with the church and staying with this order by the uh, Ukrainian government to the church to vacate that premises, the church is an autocephalous church. The bishop of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church does not report to anyone, such as the papacy or any other authority. So they're self-governing as far as the leadership of the church is concerned, and they are very influential. 
And it's good you mentioned that you said they're like brother and sister. They've been around for a while together now. And this is maybe called sibling rivalry. Uh, but is there a brewing, is there any such thing brewing where it's, they're concerned that churches with the influence that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church have can sway public opinion against the war effort? The attempts will be made. It's not in doubt. The attempts will be made. It's, it's wartime propaganda, all of these things will come up. The church will have to stand at a, uh, with a perspective to the whole thing happening. Now, what I'm saying is, Christianity is not jokes written in Russia. Unfortunately, Ukraine cannot guarantee that at this time. Will the church try to sway public opinion in the way of Russia? Yes, very much so. There's no doubt about that. These people have been married. Religion has bonded them okay, for a very long time. People are losing their children, including the church, in the war. All right? There are people who believe that Zelensky shouldn't have made an attempt to join NATO. And there are citizens of Ukraine who believe that this president is making the wrong decisions. However, it's in the perception, how you see it, and the perspective that you draw from the entire scenario. Okay? For whatever it is worth, remember also that politics is involved here. There are people who are waiting to remove Putin in Russia. His own allies are turning against him. There are also citizens of Ukraine who are thinking that we have a hot-headed president and he has brought us into a needless war. The church may tow that lane, but it doesn't mean it will make any tremendous impact on the world situation. We are getting into the final moments of the war, of extreme hostilities. We are getting into the final moments. It does not mean it won't be long drawn, but casualties will reduce because it's just a reordering. Where does the church stand goes to war? That question has to be asked. What casualties has the church suffered? How would we attempt to also reconcile the church and then also compensate the church for all the losses it has suffered? Those questions are going to be on the table. These are the factors that will lead there. Would they in any way affect the war? No. Would they in any way affect the impact of what Zelensky is doing? No. Because this is wartime and the greater number of citizens in Ukraine stand by their president and believe he has defended them so very well. And he enjoys that patronage also in the international community. Speaking of the international community, Mr. Yeniji, Spain uh, seem, do they have as much uh, weight to influence uh, Ukraine? We just read a story just before we brought you on about Spain being considered uh, to look to, to be one of the mediators in this war. Do you think Spain has that much influence, as much as well, the United States? Well, thank you for the news. I'm hearing it on channels for the first time, and I think we should give you credence for that. that uh, the headship of the European Union is changing uh, to Spain. Spain by itself boasts of tourism potentials, boasts of agriculture, and a shaky economy. Spain by itself also has Catalans to deal with who have been wanting to break away and, 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 and exercise their own sovereignty for a very long time. However, if Spain is speaking for Euro, Spain is speaking for NATO. So it's not about Spain on the local scene or the economic might it has or the military might it doesn't have. It is about speaking for the EU. Now, the president of the EU, which, I mean, this is why Germany has enjoyed such prominence before now, because Germany has led the EU for a considerable period of time. That is the reason why the United Kingdom also still plays a pivotal role, because it has made tremendous impact on the EU for a very long time. Spain by itself, no. For Spain, at the headship of the EU, it has the might of France, of Poland, of Germany standing behind it, and even for the United Kingdom. So yes, Spain suddenly becomes, uh, well, blessed with the responsibility to show direction for the rest of EU at this time on account of the headship of uh, the EU moving over to Spain. And in America, Mr. Yenigi, there's political intrigue between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, where the former president, uh, Donald J. Trump, has said in a rally, as he tries to make another run for the White House recently, that in Waco, Texas, that he'd end the war in 24 hours. He went as far as to say that the war is happening because 
the Biden administration haven't got the spine nor the will to handle matters such as this, criticizing their foreign policy. You've not asked me my opinion, but I love the question, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer it the way I like. All right. It goes without so, saying. Guess what? <laughs> the first thing is this, okay? So, that Donald Trump has not been prosecuted for January 6th, for hiding tax return, and for so many other misdemeanors, including moving files out of the White House. It's because everyone wants to give him a clear run at the presidency again. If he had been prosecuted, he wouldn't have been able to run. Okay, so there's this code of silence that people don't say publicly, but we know it, and it is since Pelosi uh, left our role as speaker. So what then happens? This is what I see. Will Donald Trump end the war in 24 hours? Donald Trump will end the war even becoming president. It's not in doubt. Donald Trump kept Putin at bay for a very long time. The war we see between Russia and Ukraine is essentially between the United States and China, with China backing uh, Russia and with the United States backing NATO and Ukraine. So that is where it comes down to. It's going to be a crescendo in a few months because by next year, United States goes to the polls. It looks as though Biden has not been able to do much. Will he get reelected? No. I doubt he will even get a ticket, okay, for Democrats. He may very well be Kamala Harris, the vice president who gets the ticket. If Biden is going to go to the polls, then it's going to be Trump versus Biden and there will be Trump. And there's no doubt about that. And Donald Trump will come out of it smelling like roses. All right. Will Donald Trump end the world? He's got the sagacity. There's no doubt. He's got the international stature to be able to do this. He's held uh, Putin at bay for a very long time. He met with the North Korean president. Historic visit. We should never forget that. With Donald Trump in office, Iran would not be shooting down drones. It won't, it won't happen. Donald Trump will be speaking, and not only so, he will be showing the military might that the United States has. The economy of the United States at the moment is also very rocky at this time. And voting for defense and voting for military has become, there's got a lot of question marks over it. So that even the democracy that Donald Trump brings almost has some parts of autocratic rule to it, which is to have his way. And some of those measures may be required. Okay, I, I hold myself back from, from saying a Yoruba adage to say that if you think that you've got a tout in your own home, there are other touts that are necessary for different times. So you see people who don't, they don't negotiate. And when they negotiate, they negotiate for soon. Leaders like Boris Johnson, leaders like Donald Trump, they are required. And very much so within the next 18 months, you'll see them playing even more active roles in ending the war in Ukraine. Is this then, therefore, not, so to speak, a vote of no confidence on the influence that the leaders of today have. Because, staying with this uh, Trump perspective for a second, he's said that Putin and Xi Jinping are great men who are leaders of their countries in such a way that they have this very great influence within their countries and across the world going as far as to say uh, they're talking about the new world order and that none of the other leaders so much as has that kind of uh, power or influence or strength, but he has. Isn't that, so there are critics that, that consider the leaders of all the Western nations and all the other leaders, not to speak of them in bad light, haven't been able to, to wield the necessary influence in this war between Russia and Ukraine. Is that so? Well, it is that, true. Yeah. It is true. It is true, and it's a vote of no confidence. But somebody has to say it. And well, the person who has to say it may not be in government at this time. And so Trump is able to say it. If Trump was president, he would have rallied all of them, either at the G7, okay, and then spoken sense to them to say, this is what we are going to do, and we are going to do it. And I would lead that. Let's look at him. Trump doesn't hold no prisoners. It doesn't waste efforts. It doesn't waste time. Now, what he recognizes, and is what we see everywhere, many of the leaders as of this time are suffering from internal insurrections. They are suffering from economic crisis. They have had to deal with labor strikes as have never been seen before. You can see it in Germany. You see it in France. It almost looks as like this is a ripple effect. So the leaders are battling wars in their own homes 
and it's, it then hampers how they are able to deal with international politicking. Only recently, the last budget, the, the spring budget that Jeremy Hunt passed for, the, uh, for England at least, showed that much more resources have been devoted towards procurement of military might. That would have been unnecessary had the war in Ukraine not, not happened. Now, uh, United Kingdom will have to be put on alert for 10 years in advance to be able to actively defend its territory. That is a blow. There's economic crisis, labor crisis going on in Europe. And with this just coming out from the pandemic. So yes, have the leaders been able to do a lot? No, it's an emphatic no. This thing came upon us from one pandemic to another war, okay? With Trump, Trump would have had the benefit of foresight and he would have had to show up his political support, even locally. You hardly find any leader in Europe at this time who is not battling or defending it himself or herself against battles from within. Putin inclusive. China, on the other hand, just gave Xi another uh, time. So he settled his own. Nobody is going to remove uh, the uh, Chinese president at this time. So he's able to meddle in international politicking. But Rishi Sunak has to deliver general elections in May. Germany has to stabilize its own economy. The same thing for Poland. So there's not much more they can do at this time. Biden, unfortunately, had so much going uh, with respect to goodwill before becoming president. But at this time, the economy just doesn't look good. We've had banks and the Silicon Valley crashing in the last two months. And it has ripened effect on the world economy. What's the value of the dollar at this time? So these presidents are fighting on different fronts. They are fighting labor unions. They are fighting uh, uh, politics in their own home. They are fighting the war in Europe. It's just too much to ask at this time. And it takes someone who will get on the job from the first day and be able to speak through to power to be able to have any significant impact. Fortunately, unfortunately, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump are just two of those people. When you say Boris Johnson, it reminds me of Winston Churchill, uh, who <laughs> they're not cut from the same cloth, we know, who became <laughs> a wartime uh, premier or um, leader of the UK. And obviously, uh, F.D. Roosevelt and people of that ilk, staying with that train of thought, well, you can't say, and I totally uh, take on board everything you've just said. What, his, what lessons can be learned from history on how the world powers are handling the situation? So the truth of the matter is, and, and it doesn't also leave out Nigeria and developing countries. I, I saw in the news two days back, uh, French colonized countries in Africa are going to uh, ditch the French currency for their own uh, regional currency. And that's a good one to see. So international politics is now local. That's what it is. There is a reordering of world powers, but you don't come to the table without bringing anything. So even Spain will be under the searchlight by December. So they become the head of the European Union in July. But those at home will be asking, what are you doing with our economy? And what are you doing with the Catalan movement? All those will come into the fall in 2024, full blast. All right. So it's the same thing. If Biden is going to do anything, he's got to rally his troops. Democrats have to come together and try to carry uh, some from uh, back at home. Okay, with respects to uh, 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 United Kingdom as well, Rishi Sunak has to deliver on the general elections to be able to justify the support the United Kingdom is giving to uh, Ukraine. China has already ticked that, and uh, China is the only country that is a bit settled back at home, even though it had the issues with the lockdown and, and dealing with the pandemic. But politically, China is settled at this time, so China can continue to uh, re-establish links and strengthen links on the international community. Japan is also fairly settled at home. So the new international politics is being settled at home. That's the new international politics. And I dare say again, the last general elections uh, for Nigeria shows that we have a few of those candidates already thinking like that. And that's how we should. Are we building our economies back at home to be able to give us a, a, a seat at the table when international politics is being discussed. 
Ghana is almost already there, saying that it's not asking for any handouts. Instead, it's asking for growth of its own local potentials. And that is what any country, what it's sought, any leader who is responsible enough and has the benefit of foresight should do. Build your local economy, build your people, increase your military might, stay as much as possible non-aligned, but even in your non-alignment, be able to identify with countries who can deal with you and you get the best of it in a win-win situation. International politics has become local politics. The International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant or call for the arrest of President Putin for what they say is war crimes. The, you, they make it clear that we are hosting, supporting Ukraine in the long term and its fight against Putin. And from there, UK-based global food corporation Cargill has said it'll stop handling Russian grain from its export terminal from July although its shipping unit will continue to carry grain from Russian ports. The company says in a statement, which uh, reads, as grain export-related challenges continue to mount, Cargill will stop elevating Russian grain for export in July 2023 after the completion of the 2022-2023 season. In addition, grain trader Viterra, part owned by Switzerland-based mining and trading giant Glencore, is planning to stop grain trading in Russia. Most international grain traders have stopped new investment in Russia since last year following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, but continued exporting Russian wheat. Now, Polish Prime Minister says Poland wants the European Union to use all tools at its disposal to limit the amount of Ukrainian grain entering the bloc's market amidst fury amongst farmers over the effect of imports on Polish grain prices. Mounting anger in the countryside over the influx of Ukrainian grain poses a major headache for Poland's ruling nationalist Law and Justice Party in an election year, as its conservative voter base mainly live around rural and small towns. Now, the Prime Minister said he'd agreed with the leaders of several countries bordering Ukraine to write to European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to demand action. During the last European Council, I agreed with the Prime Ministers of several European Union countries, those that border Ukraine, that we would forward a letter to President Ursula von der Leyen to the European Commission demanding immediate action, immediate use of all instruments, all available procedures and regulations to limit the impact of Ukrainian grain to the markets of Ukraine's neighboring countries. We are ready to help take this grain and export it to Africa. There you go. But we did not agree to this and we do not agree that this grain should be sold on the Polish market, on the Romanian market. The President and Prime Minister of Romania, with whom I spoke yesterday, had the same opinion and destabilized our domestic markets. We have almost complete knowledge of how much artillery ammunition is being used daily, weekly, monthly on the battlefield. These amounts are many times greater than the vast majority of NATO countries have today, and which they could either make available to Ukraine or build themselves, rebuilding their stocks for potential wartime needs. Because if you want peace, prepare for war. Polish Prime Minister Matthias Morawiecki. Argentine President Alberto Fernandez says the war in Ukraine has generated immeasurable damage to the world economy. During a visit with U.S. President Joe Biden at the White House, Fernandez said, in his words, we see the grave problem Russia's invasion of Ukraine has created. We need to work together and unite efforts so the war can end, so it stops ending human lives, so the world economy can recover. During his visit, President Fernandez addressed bilateral relations, U.S. support during Argentina's financial challenges and other pressing global issues. Fernandez also says peace is urgent because of the food insecurity the war can cause. Emotional elderly civilians are being evacuated by police from frontline villages in Ukraine. Ukraine police released a video showing policemen evacuating local residents from what is said to be Velkia 
Novosilka, a village less than three kilometers from the front line in Donetsk region. An unidentified local woman told the policeman in, his, in her words, I just want to get out of here. Meanwhile, a Russian man, Alexei Marshlyov, who had been sentenced to two years in prison, was detained in Belarus after failing to turn up for a hearing. He has been charged with discrediting the Russian military and was under house arrest after being accused of repeatedly publishing anti-war posts. He pleaded not guilty but failed to turn up to the hearing in the city of Yefremov on Tuesday. Prosecutors had requested two years in prison for him. According to the independent Russian telegram channel Sota, the arrest was made possible because he activated a cell phone in the apartment, allowing authorities to identify the fugitive. And finally, U.S. State Department Principal Deputy Spokesperson Vedad Patel says the United States has not received notice from Russia indicating a change in nuclear notification. Speaking at a department briefing, Patel says he'd, been, he'd seen comments from Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov that all types of notifications between Russia and the U.S. under the New START Treaty had been suspended. Patel also says that the U.S. has been concerned about Russia's reckless behavior over the treaty. And that's where we leave it on Russian Invasion Today, our special coverage. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alumide Mukoli. Do have a good day.